Hey folks, welcome to this very last video for this particular module in which we're going to start looking at the powers the president has. So specifically, what does the Constitution give the, the president the ability to do as well as not do? And also, what does the president do that's not specifically worded in the Constitution, but they do anyway because that's what a president does? So first off, the president is essentially given authority by the oath of office. They often put their hand on the Bible and they um, make a certain promise or this, they take this oath, which basically says that they will promise to make sure to enforce laws that are passed by Congress and signed by him or her or they. And at the same time that they are entrusted by the American people in order to carry out the office faithfully without uh, any sort of misguided purposes or intentions. So, the oath of office uh, is sort of long, but basically the president says that they shall faithfully execute the office of the president, so, the, so also including the duties and roles that we've talked about or that you've seen throughout the module, and that he or she or they shall also take care of the, uh, that the laws be faithfully executed. So one power that the president has is the ordinance power. And what this essentially boils down to is that the president can make an executive order at any point in time during their um, terms. So... Basically, the executive order is any sort of order that's like, it's like a command from the president to basically tell everyone what to do. These executive orders are treated almost like a law, almost as if they were passed by Congress and very like almost almost officially like law. However, they can be challenged. They can be challenged from both the Constitution and also acts of Congress. And at the same time, a president will often create an executive order to do what he, she, or they want especially when they're having resistance from Congress. Congress won't let them do what they want. So here's a history. The president uh, that has given the most amount or issued the most amount of executive orders is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but that was during the Great, uh, the New Deal and the Great Depression. And so as these states, uh, as uh, some of these in particular, as the pre uh, presidents were going through this, they were saying, look, at this particular time, they needed executive orders because Congress was not meeting or being effective enough, or they had the other political party was in power with Congress, and so the president was having a lot of opposition or resistance to what they were trying to do. Obama, at the time of this publication of this graph, <laughs> excuse me, it had issued the least amount of executive orders from 2017 to 2020. Trump has issued, I believe, 182 around that around that number um, total executive orders, which as you can see, is not the highest compared to 3,522. So examples of an executive order include Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in which he does not, he did, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free slaves. It freed people who were uh, um, essentially slaves in union controlled territory which only meant the border states. So in West Virginia, Maryland, any other country that, or sorry, not country, but state that actually was, uh, that touched in between the, the North and the South, if you were in Confederate, if you were in Union hands, then you, as a slave, then you were free. Lincoln also suspended the right of habeas corpus. For FD, FDR, that meant the, the New Deal, he also issued the executive order that created um, concentration camps in the United States, in which uh, many Japanese Americans were actually held um, in these concentration camps or internment camps during World War II and a little bit after, I believe. And also Truman, which when he ordered the desegregation of the army, allowing many people of color to participate at the same capacity and level and also be housed with and uh, essentially living with and fighting alongside white folks. So another power the president has is the appointment power. So the president can appoint ambassadors and other diplomats. So let's say that there's a new country being started. Let's call it Sanderslandia. Um, and the president is being able to, has the power to recognize that country as a legitimate country. So what they'll do is they'll appoint an ambassador to serve as the basically messenger between the United States and that particular country. And then in order for a diplomat, in order to be a approved for the office, they have to be appointed by the president. The president has to get, uh, tell, say by name who they want to fill that office. This also includes cabinet members and top aides and uh, leaders of independent agencies, such as the Department of Homeland Security, federal judges, as what you've seen with Trump and uh, nominating two to three Supreme Court cases during his term, and also officers of armed forces. The confirmation process 
involves this. So if the if a president chooses you to fulfill a particular office, you have to be nominated by the president first. So they have to say your name. They have to appoint you or recommend you to Congress. You have to go through seven different committee hearings in which you basically talk about, you know, make sure the uh, committee and Congress will make sure you're informed, that you're qualified to actually be in that office and that you can carry out the duties of the office effectively and to the public interest. And then there's a debate. So if Republicans don't like it, the fact that a Democrat uh, is nominated to be in a very powerful position, then they may debate that heavily and say, like, we don't want this particular individual because they're too powerful or they – for yada, yada, for the reasons to go on and on. So then at the end of the debate, this then it will either – it will all can vote uh, – will all vote. And so if its majority easily votes and says yes, then that person is confirmed to actually hold that office or they're rejected in which they cannot hold that office. There's also the removal power. The power can put you in a – the president can put you in a certain position but can also remove you from that office as well. So you, they can actually remove certain positions, uh, most particularly um, appointed positions. The president is also considered the chief diplomat. So this is the part that's not in the Constitution. The Constitution does not make too many references to foreign outside countries besides what's in the United States and the 13 states that were um, first formed under the Constitution. But the president over time has had to be able to negotiate on and represent America on behalf of uh, American interests overseas um, and abroad. So because of that, the chief diplomat role has been kind of created in which the president has to negotiate treaties and other things with other countries uh, as issues come up. And it's also assumed that the military is diplomatic, that if the president, just as much as they can make a treaty and peacefully try to end conflict, they can also send the military into a different country, um, assuming it's not violating UN regulations and laws. And then this would also uh, take place with Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations. So after the Treaty of Versailles, which ends World War One, I, I believe in 1920, Woodrow Wilson is going to go to the, the treaty negotiations and say, look, we need to have like something similar to the UN. It was the predecessor or the original UN, but it failed because Woodrow Wilson signed the treaty, had the treaty um, passed. But then when he tried to take it to Congress to get it ratified, particularly the Senate, they said, no, we're not doing this. We don't want to um, get involved in other conflicts. We want to be isolationist. So then the League of Nations failed. But Woodrow Wilson originally tried to create that with diplomacy. Executive agreements are treaties, essentially, between leaders of multiple countries, and this can also be um, easier than treaties because it's not as – it's not it's more like a temporary agreement rather than it is a permanent law. The power of recognition. This is the ability for country uh, – for um, the president to recognize people from other countries as well as particular countries in general to say that they are countries. So this happened in the case of Israel where a lot of uh, um, Middle Eastern countries still say that uh, Israel is not a, an official country. They don't recognize it as a country because they think that they stole land from the Palestinians. Therefore, um, the president was able to say, look, this is an official country because we recognize Israel as a state. The president also serves as commander in chief, meaning that they oversee all bran five branches of the government and be able and are able to make decisions based on their preference for either entering conflict or resolving conflict. This is almost without limits, and the president usually relies on military subordinates like officers and generals to actually advise them on what to do. And the uh, president can also make undeclared war due to the war powers resolution um, in the United Nations in which the president can send in troops for no more than 60 days. But if there is a significant force of American troops with um, in between that 60 days, then they're, they're allowed. There's also legislative power, which includes the message power, uh, which is the State of the Union, the budget message, and economic report. This is the president where they come to Congress every year and they say, look, here's the State of the Union, here's the State of the United States. And what we're seeing are these problems. So what we want to do is um, tell you what it is, this, the State of the Power. There's also the veto power. The president can sign a bill, veto a bill that would require two-thirds of the Congress override. Allow it to become a bill uh, in 10 days if they do nothing or just a pocket veto. They just sit on the bill and never do anything with it. They can also have judicial powers in which they can reprieve or postpone particular punishments and also pardon individuals who have been convicted of wrongdoing. With that, I want you to keep going through the module. Make sure you turn in your assignments. If you have questions, reach out to me. And if you need anything, make sure to ask or communicate or advocate for yourself because if you're not, then how am I supposed to know what's going on? I hope you have a beautiful evening.